Hi there. Today I want to talk about a new model for sense making and the impact that this has on health information science. As a physician, one of the key roles I have on a day to day basis is as a decision maker. Many decisions are made every hour, and many of them are actually made unconsciously. Many times we try to understand decision making in a traditional view, when in fact decision making often occurs in time pressured environment with incomplete information and I think really requires a completely different model. As well, traditional models tend to study and focus on cognitive biases and use novice learners such as medical students and residents to study decision making amongst physicians. Now this makes sense because these are often easy to get a hold of and are easy to recruit into studies. A different approach would focus on how experts make decisions in a real-world environment. This approach has been called macrocognition or naturalistic decision making. It was at first originally developed by Klein and his group of cognitive psychologists back in the 1990s. They found that using experienced professionals such as fire chiefs didn't make decisions using classic traditional methods where it was believed that a list of all possible choices was mentally created and then the best option was chosen. This leads to teaching methods that focus on developing extensive lists of options and incorrect decisions are viewed as a failure to adequately consider all of these options. Instead, the process of situation recognition, mental model development, problem detection, and simulation occur with only resulting in one or two possible solutions to a situation. Now, medicine has followed the traditional model of extensive list development, such as the desire to generate a vast differential diagnosis and teaching, but in practice, most experienced clinicians can only generate one or two possible solutions to a problem. However, before one can come up with a solution, you first must understand the problem. Sense making, as defined by weak, is the process of providing structure to the unknown and placing data into a framework. This step is part of naturalistic decision making, and Klein has advanced a data frame theory to understand sense making. The purpose of this talk is to advance that theory into the realm of health information science specifically in the realm of physician decision making. In order to introduce the theory, we first need to be clear on some of our terminology. The first term to understand is data. What is data? Well, this is any element or fact that is used to represent a physical object or concept. A hemoglobin level is a piece of data. Similarly, a chunk of data such as polycythemia can represent a variety of different concepts including a low hemoglobin, low white blood cell count, and low platelet count, all within one statement called polycythemia. Next, we need to understand what a frame is. A frame is any container that the data fits in to give it structure. In other literature, the term phrase has also been used in other senses such as framework or mental model, but in general they all include the same general concept. Sense making, as I've mentioned earlier, is the process of fitting the data into a coherent frame. Now this is a two-way street such as the data creates the frame and as we'll see the frame also influences the search for data. The best analogy to understand the relationship between data and frames is cons to consider a puzzle. Each piece of the puzzle you could consider a data point and the whole puzzle put together defines the frame. And as you can see as the pieces come together the data defines the frame and the structure of the puzzle but at the same time the remaining spaces left directs the search for the other pieces in the puzzle to fill in the rest of the frame. Once you have all of the pieces and they are fit into the right place, the frame is complete, the picture is complete, and sense making has occurred. Now you may notice that in this case each frame only contains four data elements. 
I use that deliberately because many studies have shown that humans can only track three or four concepts in working memory at any time, and the act of sense making is an active cognitive process. If there's more data than can be managed in working memory, then sequential frames need to be created in order to understand all of the concepts. And indeed, as you can see, each of these frames becomes part of the data for another frame. So for example, SIRS becomes sepsis, becomes septic shock, becomes multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Each concept enveloping one of the concepts below it as part of a larger concept. When I'm told that somebody has multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, I automatically have the frame that includes the subframe of septic shock, which implies that they have sepsis, which implies that they've had a surge response. Going even below that, just simply saying somebody has a surge response already raises another set of data points, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature, which give me a clue to the overall patient's condition and assist with sense making. So now consider the patient I might see with low blood pressure, fever, high white blood cell count, and x-ray changes. As you can see the pieces coming together, it's starting to look like pneumonia. So the search continues and I'll look for more data to find, to try to fit into this frame that I think is probably pneumonia. And in the search for the data, I find these other two elements and bring them into the frame. This all fits, and I now have a complete frame, which means this patient has pneumonia, and sense-making has now occurred. This cycle of frame creation and data search and fitting the data into the frame continues on an endless cycle until all of the data fits into the frame. Now there are times where there is a difference between the data and the frame being constructed. In that case, the next step is to question the frame. This extra data can either be congruent or incongruent with the frame. If the data appears to be congruent with the frame, then well, perhaps the frame itself needs to be adjusted. Klein called this step elaborating the frame when the frame is inadequate to explain all of the data and thus the frame needs to be expanded to accommodate the additional data. If some of the data is incongruent with the frame, then the rest of the original data has to be reviewed as there may be other incongruencies in the data that was initially missed, or it may be that the extra data is just simply irrelevant and can be ignored. But either way, this data needs to be either squared or rejected. On the other hand, if the data is relevant, then you really are forced into creating a second frame. This is called reframing by Klein in his original studies. Now remember, no data can exist without a frame. And as well, data can be moved or co-located in both frames temporarily as you're going through the process of squaring the frames and trying to bring congruence to the frames that you've already created. Creating the two frames from the data then requires them to be brought either together or to reject one of them. This second frame is often considered the alternative diagnosis that's being actively considered. But in order to reject one of the competing frames, often you need to run a mental simulation in order to make a final choice on the final diagnosis. And at the end of the day, Either these two frames are brought together or one is rejected. Now, while the concept itself seems to be relatively straightforward, in fact, in medical decision making, this theory is actually a novel concept. And this is despite the fact that there is an ample amount of literature in other disciplines on the application and exploration of this theory in decision making in those groups. This theory does have significant consequences, in my opinion, that impact on many areas of health information science. In the realm of medical education, I've already indicated that there is a significant difference in this model 
versus the way we traditionally teach residents and physicians. I think part of the reason seems to be that medical decision making literature often treats the novice as a separate species. This model assumes, and I believe rightfully, that the only difference between a novice and an expert is the repertoire of their frames. Let's be realistic. Medical residents are adults. They may not seem to be like adults, and sometimes, regrettably, we don't treat them like adults. But they are actually adults who have often a large amount of life experience and, and as well, are very intelligent people with adult mental processing skills that have completely matured. These are learners that don't need to learn how to think. They need exposure to a wide variety of stimuli with deliberative feedback in order to help them build their frames and understand what data is relevant. This means that mentors need to be explicit in describing what data they're using and how they're organizing it into the correct frame when they're making sense of the patient and when they're making a decision. The data frame theory also challenges the current approach to handover. Consider handover, and you would think of it as essentially the act of transmitting a series of data and frames about a patient from one physician to another in order to allow them to make sense of the patient and provide care for the patient in a continuous fashion. While poorly structured handover is definitely associated with patient harm, I believe that overly protocolized processes may be of a little additional benefit. As well, different physicians at different levels of experience likely require different handover methods to transmit the data and the frames and to permit sense making. I believe this model should challenge researchers to focus on comparing handover methods between groups of physicians at various levels of training instead of just relying on easily accessible groups such as residents. We may find that the quality of the data and the type of frames that are being transmitted differ significantly from when a resident is talking to another resident and when a skilled clinician is speaking to a skilled clinician. This theory would suggest that those experienced clinicians will tend to use frames that are much better defined with less raw data and more concepts in order to transmit information more efficiently as opposed to where a resident would give a lot more surface detail such as data points like lab values and blood pressure, which for the experienced clinician are not necessarily relevant because they change day by day and minute by minute. The theory also has significant impact on clinical information systems. Physicians primarily use clinical information systems to understand and make sense of their patients. As such, the focus has been on providing the maximum amount of data on the screen. This may be backfiring though, as it probably contributes significantly to information overload and is not providing any additional benefit to sense making. In previous work I've done, it demonstrates that physicians rely on a relatively short set of data elements when reviewing a patient in a critical care information system and the data frame model shows why that a large data set is probably unnecessary in order to permit sense making. Physicians do require a small amount of high valued data in order to develop the frame and then need the ability to easily search for additional data to elaborate the frame as necessary. I believe that clinical information systems as they're currently constructed probably contribute to inhibiting sense making by their one size fit alls approach to design. A fixed design and layout is probably ill-suited for most physicians as it's not flexible enough to meet their individual sense-making needs. Now beyond simple customization at the beginning of implementation, we could look at using intelligent systems that can respond to the user and evolve the data that is being displayed and also suggest additional data elements that others may have found relevant in order to 
enhance the frame and facilitate better sense making using deep learning and large data sets. To conclude, the data frame theory is a novel concept in medical decision making and has failed to focus on decision making by experienced clinicians in the real world, which is constrained by time, imperfect knowledge, and distractions. You can see where cognitive biases such as confirmation bias can occur even within this model, and I'm certainly not suggesting that the data frame theory avoids these errors. Indeed, one of Klein's larger detractors pointed out that this is essentially where a lot of cognitive errors occur, and other methods of thinking, usually more deliberately using our working memory, can serve to avoid those cognitive biases. However, that is not how most decision making occurs in the real world, and I believe that evolution has set us up to make decisions quickly because it is life saving, more efficient energetically, and usually works. This model seeks to better understand the real world decision making that occurs in order to facilitate future research. Experts make decisions after making sense using a few elements in order to create a frame. The relationship can be thought like a puzzle, where there is an ongoing relationship between the data creating the frame and the frame driving the search for additional data. Incongruent data has to be explained either by elaborating the frame or reframing completely and selecting from a choice of two competing frames. The implications of this, of this model extend from how we train physicians to how we communicate between ourselves and also how we should interact with clinical information systems. By understanding this model, we have a new way of understanding the way people think in the real world and can also now focus our research efforts on better understanding the real world environment that we all live in and where actual decisions are being made instead of in the lab.